So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to start, uh, well, now it's time. So welcome to this uh, first uh, NISC webinar of the year. Uh, we are uh, starting uh, the year with uh, the NISC benchmark suite. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Pascal. I'm the dissemination uh, leader for the NISC project, and I'll be your host today. And uh, today I have two speakers with me. Uh, I will introduce them uh, very shortly. So uh, I would like to uh, explain a little bit the context of, of, of this webinar because it's one of a series. So um, a project and um, we've, we are coming close to the end of the project and we have uh, quite a lot of um, uh, material to share. Uh, we've been uh, working on, on quantum computing use cases, uh, use cases for or that could um, that could work on, on early quantum computing systems. So at this point, uh, our uh, aim is is to to uh, help the the quantum computing community libraries and tools uh, we, we've developed and, and, and we make uh, available possible. So that's why we are organizing monthly webinars about uh, our uh, different uh, use cases. We've had a number of them already. Um, and uh, they've been recorded, by the way. So if you're interested, uh, we have a YouTube channel. You can listen to our past webinars. And we we are going to have monthly webinars until the end of the year. So um, mm. the full program is on our website. Mm. Uh, so um, the next one is, is on the 6th of February. And um, it will be about finance. Uh, financial applications. And then in March, we will talk about methods to improve the results of quantum computing measurements that's related to, chemi to chemistry. Um, and um, in April, we will talk about uh, uh, quantum and natural language processing, and there is more to come. So uh, really, uh, I, I encourage you to have a look at our web page um, to, to know what's coming up. So uh, let's get to today's subject. If I can move to the next slide, yes. Uh, so today's speakers are Dr. Gonzalo Ferro for, from uh, SESGA and Dr. Diego Andrade from uh, the University of Acaruna. And I really thank them for being here today. Um, and uh, I would like to mention the related publications and open source libraries. Um, so we're going to talk about the benchmark suite. It is available, uh, both uh, the, 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 the reference software itself and an online documentation. So uh, re really uh, feel free to, to visit uh, those, those sites to download the documents and to use our um, libraries and, and software. So I will hand over to uh, Gonzalo and Diego. I think it's Diego first. Uh, ready to take the floor? Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. It's your turn. <laughs> I will stop sharing. Okay, so and you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So uh, my name is Diego Andrade. I come from the University of A Coruña. Uh, and in this presentation, in this webinar, I'm going to present uh, the benchmark suite for quantum computers that we have created together with CESGA in the context of the NIST project. Uh, so the, the first half of the presentation will be done by myself and the second half will be done by Gonzalo uh, uh, Ferro from, from SESGA. So let's start. So let me introduce first our two inst institutions. The SESGA is the Galician Supercomputing uh, Center. It's part of the 
Spanish supercomputing uh, network. And it runs obviously a supercomputer, the uh, Finisterre 3, but also a quantum computer with 32 uh, qubits. And he's also a very active participant in the biggest Spanish effort in quantum computing, which is the project uh, Quantum Space. My institution is the University of A Coruña. It's a public university, which is located in the same geographical uh, region than Tesga, in the northwest of Spain. Uh, its academic offer is uh, focused mostly uh, on architecture and engineering, and in any kind of engineering, including civil engineering, industrial engineering, and computer science engineering. The research offer is aligned uh, with the academic offer, and we have several research uh, centers. Uh, one of them, CITIC, that is the one I belong to, is focused on the research on the topics related to computer uh, science. So before uh, I start with the introduction of benchmarking in quantum computing and uh, our benchmarking suite, let me introduce you the general topic of benchmarking. Benchmarking is about testing the capabilities of something in real line. Uh, this can be done uh, in different domains. For instance, we can uh, benchmark a card, uh, a production line in a factory, etc. In computer science, normally benchmarking is related to uh, assessing the capabilities uh, of a classical uh, computer. So in this case, we are going to take into account both the software part and the hardware part. In general, we are going to try to uh, test all the uh, components of the architectural stack. From the beginning, we will consider in the first place the classical processor, the CPU. Uh, maybe we can have an accelerator like a GPU or a FPGA. And then we have the software part of the stack with the compiler, the languages, the algorithms that are used to uh, implement uh, a given routine, and also the specific implementations uh, provided by a programmer or a, good, a group of programmers. Uh, in classical computer science, there are well-established de facto standards for benchmarking classical computers. Uh, in, at the level of the CPU, we have the spec CPU, which is a suite composed of several benchmarks, which are uh, representative of the kind of workloads that you usually uh, want to run in a classical uh, processor. Uh, so here we are going to find compilers, uh, physical simulations, applications related to artificial intelligence, etc. At the, at the supercomputer le sup supercomputing level, uh, we have the top 500 lists, at least the top 500 supercomputers in the world. And the list is elaborated according the, to the performance of the supercomputers running a single benchmark, which is the LIMPAC benchmark. We have other alternatives like the NAS parallel benchmarks and may many more that I'm not going to mention here. Recently, uh, the performance, sorry, the power efficiency of the computers has become uh, a topic of interest. So uh, because of this, we have the green counterpart of the top 500 list uh, that uh, lists the top 500 uh, uh, supercomputers in the world, but ordered according to uh, its power uh, efficiency. This means not gigaflops, but gigaflots per watt uh, consume. And also the spec CPU has a green counterpart, which will be the spec uh, power uh, suite. Uh, I would like to finish this part of the presentation outlining the common characteristics to all uh, this benchmarking uh, methodology. Uh, I do that because I believe that we have tried to inherit all these characteristics in our own approach. The first characteristic is that normally the application that, compa that compose a suite are uh, uh, considered because they are representative of the kind of workloads that you want to run in a classical computer. Sometimes they operate at the kernel level. So here we have 
uh, operations mostly from linear algebra, like matrix multiplications or convolutions. Sometimes we operate at the application level. So for instance, we can have a machine learning training or a compiler or something like that. And sometimes we create a specific software to express certain characteristics of the hardware that we consider uh, relevant to assess uh, its performance. So we can have a benchmark to stress uh, the memory usage. We can have a benchmark uh, to test the vectorization capabilities, etc. The second aspect that is common to all the benchmark suites is the reproducibility. If we want to uh, be able to compare uh, two platforms, for instance, uh, we have to be able to replicate all the components of the stack, or at least uh, the relevant ones. So this means that we have to include, as a result of the execution of a benchmark, a very complete documentation about all the configurations that are relevant for the performance of the execution. Finally, the last aspect that is common and that I would like to highlight, highlight are the metrics that are used to uh, measure the performance. In classical computer science, it's common to use productivity uh, metrics like uh, MIPS, millions of instructions per second, gigaflops, millions of instructions of floating point operations per second, and the power efficiency one will be uh, gigaflops per watt. Sometimes we use only the row, uh, the row time spent from the beginning to the end of the execution of the, of the task, and that will be the wall time. And sometimes we use some speed up with respect to a very slow reference machine. Uh, in classical computer science, normally we include at the end a validation that the result uh, generated by the classical computer is correct. Uh, although in classical scientific applications, normally uh, the computations are mostly accurate. However, in fields like machine learning, it's becoming very common that accuracy is playing an increasing important, uh, increasingly important uh, role. So let's move now to the part of quantum computing. First of all, I would like to compare the stack of execution that we men mentioned before for classical computers uh, with the corresponding one for quantum computers. At the topmost level uh, of the stack, we have uh, the applications of the algorithms as it happened in the classical uh, version, but in this case, the kind of uh, applications and algorithms that we have are different. We are going to find quantum phase estimation, for instance, quantum Fourier transform, applications of quantum optimization, quantum simulation, etc. In a lower level, we are going to find uh, languages and compilers. For instance, in the software development kits, we have several alternatives like MyQLN, PennyLane, or Quizkit. Or we can use a quantum programming language like QCL, QSharp, or QEN. ASM. Uh, and at a lower level, and as it happens also in classical computers, these high level languages are translated into an assembly language. Although here we have an additional actor, which will be the transpiler. So the assembly languages that we have available, or examples of this, are Q QASM, OpenQASM, Quill, etc. In the physical level, in quantum computing, uh, we have a high variability. Uh, for instance, we can use different technologies to implement the qubits. Uh, we can have available different kinds of quantum gates, and we can use different types of fault tolerance techniques. And maybe at the lowest level of the stack, we can have, instead of real hardware, a quantum uh, simulator. So before we talk about our own approach, I would like to outline the main approaches that we have uh, in benchmarking in quantum computing. For doing so, uh, I would like to establish this classification. Some of the existing approaches for benchmarking a quantum computer, computer are focused on the hardware level. Examples of these 
will be the cycle benchmarking that tries to estimate the state preparation and measurement errors, or the randomized circuits, which are based on the IBM volume, uh, volumetric uh, volumes uh, concept. Some approaches try to uh, compare different compilers or the effect on performance of different compilers. And an example of this will be the R-line quantum suite. Uh, other approaches are uh, more ambitious and try to ev evaluate the performance of the whole st stack of execution. And the most remarkable example of this will be the Munich Quantum Toolkit, also known as MQT. And finally, uh, the top level of the approaches uh, focus on the application-oriented level. So this means that we are trying to identify uh, relevant applications of quantum computing, and we try to evaluate the performance uh, of different platforms uh, running this kind uh, of workloads. Our approach, which is named EMBS, falls in this category, but other uh, remarkable uh, examples will be Supermark and Atos uh, QScore. And although this one is application inspired, because the applications that are run are real, they have a certain uh, component of hardware uh, level benchmarking. So let's focus now and in the following uh, in the Denise uh, benchmark suite. That is the suite that we have created in the context of the NIST project. This has been developed by SESGA UDC as part of, mainly by SESGA and UDC as part of the NIST project, but we have counted with very relevant and important contributions from other partners of the project. They help us to identify kernels that are common to one of several fields of applications of quantum computing. They help us to identify a test case associated to each kernel uh, whose output can be classically verifiable. Uh, and they collaborated with us in the elaboration of the corresponding uh, documentation uh, to each case. Uh, in order to understand uh, the main characteristics of our, uh, of our benchmark suite, uh, I have prepared this outline. The first one is that the suite is application oriented. So this means that we have considered the type of workloads that we believe are common to uh, many fields of application of quantum co computing. Uh, we have several individual benchmarks which are independent, independent from each other. They are defined at the procedural or mathematical level. This means that maybe one of these uh, applications can be uh, implemented using different algorithmic approaches, but we are not going to link our benchmark to a, a specific algorithmic approach. Also, we can implement the algorithm using different languages or different uh, SDK, SDKs, but we are not linking, linked to a particular implementation. Although in a repository, we are pro providing a sample a candidate implementation for each benchmark. The second thing that I would like to highlight is that it tries to evaluate all the components of the stack at the same time. So from this point of view, it can also fall in the category of full stack uh, benchmarking techniques. And also it's important to remark that uh, every benchmark can be executed for a variable number of qubits that can be uh, configured in advance. So this means that the same benchmark can be configured in advance to be executed, for instance, for uh, 30 qubits, but also for 1,000 qubits. So this means that our benchmarking uh, methodology is suitable for the NIST era, but is also ready for the post-NIST uh, era. All the results of all the benchmarks can be verify, verified uh, by classical means, which is going to give us a, a measurement of the accuracy of the execution, as well as of the performance. And all this evaluation is going to be done uh, using metrics. These metrics 
uh, allow us to evaluate both the performance and the accuracy of the computation. And they are defined separately for each benchmark. This means that we don't have a single metric that we are going to apply to every benchmark, but we are going to have like different uh, metrics uh, that are suitable for a specific uh, benchmark. We will see examples of this uh, with Gonzalo. So overall, the question that we are trying to answer for the users is that if I have a quantum platform, how suitable this platform is to solve a given type of problems. And we are going to uh, obtain an assessment of this. Getting into the uh, methodology, uh, the, the, the benchmark suite is composed of several individual benchmarks. Each one of these benchmarks is defined around a kernel. A kernel is a core quantum subroutine, which is defined at the highest possible level. This means mathematically or procedurally. This kernel has to be interesting because it's commonly used in several algorithms or several application domains of quantum uh, computing. And it may be implemented using different algorithmic approaches or different procedures, but we are not going to link officially the benchmark to any of these approaches. The second component of each benchmark is the benchmark test case. Uh, this is a problem that requires the repeated execution of the aforementioned kernel and whose output has to be verifiable analytically or through a classical simulation. And this is going to uh, be used to assess the accuracy and the performance of the execution of the, of the kernel in a real environment. Uh, this benchmark test case is going to include also a very precise and very detailed standardized procedure of execution that has to be respected by any implementation of the benchmark. We are providing templates uh, in software for this. Uh, and finally, for every benchmark, we are going to have several metrics. Some of them are going to try to verify uh, to which extent the result is correct. And some of them are going to verify how long it takes the execution uh, of the benchmark test case. So regarding the output generated by the suite, uh, the output is going to be summarized uh, per benchmark in a single JSON file, which is a test structure uh, format, and is going to contain all the information that is relevant to make the experiment reproducible. So this means that we are going to keep record of information about, for instance, the quantum platform, the execution stack, all the relevant uh, components of the execution stack, the results obtained for the verification and the performance uh, metric, and the file that is generated this way can be uh, uh, uploaded to the TMBS centralized repository uh, uh, of results that will be uh, available soon. Regarding the methodology that we have uh, de uh, deployed for the benchmark suite, the first one is that the definition of all the benchmark case has been uh, done following a template that is published uh, in the uh, NIST project uh, website. Uh, this definition has to be done at the procedural or the mathematical level. So I remark again, not link it, not link it to a given algorithmic approach or to a given implementation. Although we have a repository with sample candidate uh, implementations using the evident MyQLN uh, framework uh, uh, for the, for the uh, implementation. All the current benchmarks, all the current available benchmarks have been extracted from use cases of the NIST project, although we are planning to include new cases from other fields uh, in the near future. And in the future, in the near future, we are going to make public the repository website that contains both information about the suite, but will also serve as a reporting and result comparison 
a repository. This means that anybody can upload their own executions in the repository to be compared with the community ones. So this will be an, uh, the screenshot of the part of the website of the NIST project where you can find uh, all the information about the suite. This is uh, one readme of the repository with the, some example uh, implementations of every benchmark. And these are screenshots of the website uh, with the repository uh, of results. So, uh, now uh, I'm going to uh, welcome Gonzalo uh, Ferro to the presentation. He's going to introduce uh, the four uh, benchmarks that we have uh, included in the benchmark suite uh, so far, which are the probability loading micro benchmark, the amplitude estimation, the quantum phase estimation, and the uh, parent uh, Hamiltonian. Thank you, Gonzalo. You can proceed whenever you want. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to share my my slides. Uh, okay. Boom, 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 boom. We can see your slide, but it, it's not in yeah, the, yeah, the slideshow. Yeah. Uh, I am ah, okay here, and I am not able to. to, 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 to. Ah, no me deja poner. <laughs> ah, sorry, I That's am, the demo uh, I effect, have, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, 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 one second. Ah. Uh, es que no me deja. Ya. Yeah. Okay. No sé qué. No sé con English license mode. Okay. 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 Okay, now you can see this, the, you can see the screen, okay? Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Thank sorry. You, okay, okay. Uh, so, um, well, as Diego, as Diego said, uh, um, I want to describe the different micro benchmarks that we have implemented under the NEASQC benchmark suite. Uh, all these benchmarks, as Diego said, were extracted from the use case of the, um, of the different use case of the NEASQC project and are the probability loading, the amplitude estimation, the quantum phase estimation, and the parent Hamiltonian. So, uh, first of all, uh, in order to describe the, the benchmark, the micro benchmarks, we need to use the terminology that Diego presented before. We need to explain what is a kernel, what is the benchmark state, and what are the different metrics that we are going to use for the micro benchmark. So uh, the third micro benchmark is the probability loading algorithm. And in this case, um, um, we are going to provide the kernel description that, as Diego said, it should be defined in a very high level. In this case, we are going to provide a mathematical definition. And in the case of the probability loading kernel, we want to build a unitary operator U that loads a discrete probability distribution into the amplitude of a quantum state. As I say, I only provide the mathematical definition, but we don't fix uh, or link uh, to any a probability loading algorithm for building this unitary operator. In fact, if you know about, more about the well, the different probability loading algorithms that you can use for building this U operator, we can recommend the reading of the two deliverables that were developed uh, under the framework of the work package five of the project that do a review of the state of the art for price and computing of bar, because uh, in this there have some sections that they are devoted to review the different probability loading uh, algorithms during the last years. <laughs> So, of course, we have the kernel, and what is the benchmark case? Of course, as Diego said, uh, we are going to use a particular problem that we want to solve. In this case, we are going to load a new Gaussian probability discrete distribution. So, here is the complete procedure. In the, in the first part, in the left part, we explicitly say, step by step, the... Um, 
the things that you have to do in order to create the, this um, probability discrete distribution. And once you have this probability discrete distribution, you have to choose some probability loading algorithm that allows you to create the U operator that loads this array into the quantum state. When you have that, you are going to execute the quantum program and you are going to measure all the qubits a number a defined number of times that is given by this equation from here. So um, the idea is that you are going to measure all the possible states and you are going to compute the probability of obtaining a final state when you execute this circuit. This is the quantum measuring probability density of the U operator. So uh, in order to implement this code into the GitHub, we have selected the original uh, probability loading algorithm from Brassard et al. and they uh, developed it in 2002. And this kind of algorithm needs uh, the implementation of some operation that is called rotation control by state. And in fact, in our library, you can choose uh, two different implementation of these rotations. You can use a brute force direct method that is a direct implementation of the Brassard paper, and you can use the quantum multiplexer that is the implementation provided by Sende uh, in a 2006 paper. Here we can uh, show how, uh, <clears throat> how uh, unitary, unitary operator uh, shows as a circuit uh, when you use the fruit force method or, you, or when you use the quantum multiplexer. As you say, when you use quantum multiplexer, circuits tend to be uh, lower, with lower depths. So, what are the metrics that we are going to do? Remember, as Diego say, each microbit mark has uh, their own metrics. So in this case, the metrics that we are going to use are metrics that allow us to compare the probability density measured from the quantum device and the theoretical distribution that, remember, is a Gaussian one. So we fix it. Uh, these metrics are the color of Smirnov and the Kullback label divergence that are uh, two very well-known metrics that are used a lot in classical statistics for comparing um, probability distributions. Um, what are the applications? Uh, there are a lot of applications that use this probability loading kernel as a quantum case routine, like in quantum PCR, the HLHL algorithm, or even quantum amplitude estimation. Um, the second micro benchmark is the amplitude estimation one. Again, we are going to provide the kernel definition. In this case, uh, we have a unitary operator A and the amplitude estimation kernel aims to find the amplitude of a fixed two state phi zero or the final state. So when we apply this unitary operator, we can split the final state into good states. This is the phi zero state, bad state, the phi one states. And the thing what we want to estimate is the probability of getting a good state. So so at the end of the day, we want to estimate this lower case A. So how in a quantum device can estimate this lower case A? Uh, there are a lot of algorithms. In, in fact, this uh, amplitude estimation kernel is very paradigmatic of that. The things that Diego say, we have defined the, the, the kernel, but we don't fix the implementation. And in fact, you have a lot of implementations for doing this, uh, for solving this amplitude estimation kernel. kernel. In general, you can choose or quantum canonical phase estimation or a uh, several a group of iterative algorithms. Uh, again, we can reference to the two before mentioned uh, uh, project deliverables where there are some sections that are devoted only to study the review of different state-of-the-art amplitude estimation algorithms. Here, uh, with the peer, uh, how this kind of algorithm works, you need to the unitary operator a, you are going to build the Grover uh, operator of this uh, unitary operator A, and if you want to use canonical quantum phase estimation, you are going to provide the unitary operator to the quantum phase estimation, and you are going to estimate the corresponding agent values. And the corresponding agent values can be related with the lower case A that we want to estimate using these formulas from here, from the, from the bottom. In the iterative algorithms, you are going to apply this Grover operator again, and you are going to apply the Grover operator Several times, you are going to do several measurements and you are going to classical post processing the, the, these measurements. And you are going to compute another K that is the number of times that you should apply the Grover operator. You are going to iterate over and over this, um, this loop until the algorithm allows you, uh, returns you 
to, low, to upper and lower bonds, such that the difference between the bonds is lower than a epsilon. This epsilon is an input of the amplitude estimation algorithm. And the idea is that the lower case A that we want to estimate uh, belongs to this interval that is defined by the upper and the lower bonds with a high probability. In fact, the confidence level, the alpha uh, confidence level, is another input of this kind of uh, iterative algorithms. Well, what is the benchmark scale that we are going to use? Of course, we are going to build a unitary operator that encodes in their lowercase a the integral of a sine function in two very well uh, defined intervals. In the first interval, the integral it will be positive, and in the second one, the integral will be negative. So, what is the procedure? Okay, this is the complete procedure. The idea is, of course, we are going to fix the number of qubits. We are going to discretize the domain of the integral, and we are going to compute for each value of the interval uh, the, sign, the corresponding sign value. The idea is normalize this array, this array of sign, and with this normalized array, we can compute the integral uh, as a Riemann sum. In fact, we are going to use the Riemann sum as the target metric that we have to, to obtain. When you have this normalized discrete sign array, you are going to create a unitary operator that lowers these uh, values into a quantum state using this operator USUF. This operator USUF is the controlled state by rotation that I mentioned in the probability loading kernel. Okay, <laughs> Once you have this Created, when you have created this UCF operator, you are going to sandwich them between Hadamard gates. Um, be aware, if you are using n qubits for discretizing the domain, you are going to need one qubit extra for creating the operator. Well, it can be so that this operator works in this world, in this, uh, as show this equation from here. Here, um, the amplitude of the zero zero state, the final amplitude of the zero zero state when you apply this a operator is equal to this uh, quantity from here. That is the sum of the different values of the discretized normalizing sign function. So if we can have an algorithm, an amplitude estimation algorithm that you, can, you are going to provide the operator A, the amplitude estimation algorithm uh, returns you this lower case A that can be uh, uh, equated, uh, equal to this, uh, to this, uh, to this quantity. So you, when you have this lowercase a, you can plug into the, this definition and you can have an estimation of what is the integral that you want to compute. So we are going to compute or we are going to measure the value of the of this integral. So what are the different amplitude estimation? A priori, you can use any amplitude estimation that you want, but in the GitHub, we have uh, implemented uh, five kinds of uh, amplitude estimation. The classical quantum phase estimation from Brassard, the maximum likelihood amplitude estimation from Suzuki, the iterative quantum amplitude estimation from Dimitri Grinko, and a real quantum amplitude estimation that was developed by our colleagues Alberto Manzano and Daniel Musso that were developed under the Work Package 5 uh, um, framework. Uh, the first three algorithms only can estimate lowercase a when they are positive, and the for one can uh, estimate lowercase that can be positive or negative. So the three first algorithm will properly work in the first interval, but fail in the second one, and the real quantum amplitude estimation work properly in the two intervals that are defined for the micro benchmark. So as I mentioned before, the metric that we are going to use is the absolute error between the Riemann sum and the computed uh, and the measurement integral of the quantum estimation. Um, there are a lot of applications that have this uh, amplitude estimation kernel of a core twin, like finance, Latin finance, chemistry, numeric integration, and in fact, in most of the algorithms, the amplitude estimation usually is the last step of the of the algorithm. And the third case is the quantum phase estimation, and the kernel can be very definitely defined in a very easy way. You have a unitary operator U. We want to estimate all the all the agent values. We are going to use the quantum phase estimation procedure for estimating these agent values. And the idea is that we are going to use as a benchmark case, we are going to estimate the engine values of a chronicle product of a reset gate. As you can see here, this is the reset gate. We, this is the uh, chronicle product of a reset gate. We have fixed the different parameters of the reset gate. And this uh, operator have a um, advantage uh, behavior because we can compute in a very easy way and very efficiently um, the different engine values that uh, conform this, this, the, its spectrum. So, 
Of course, what is the procedure for the benchmark test case? We are going to select the number of qubits. We are going to fix a number of auxiliary qubits. This is the, the quantum phase estimation have two kind of register, the auxiliary qubits one and the end qubits where the uh, operator will be applied. Um, you are going to build the this set operator, and for fixing the angles, you can select two kind of methods: a random method where all the angles will be selected randomly, or a sad method with you fix the angles following this formula that depends on the number of auxiliary qubits. In the first case, in the random case, the quantum phase estimation will provide an approximation to the engine value that you want to measure. And in the exact case, the quantum phase estimation should give the exact value of the engine values of the R set uh, operator. When you have built this R set operator, you are going to build the quantum phase estimation circuit. Uh, in this case, we are aware that you are need to uh, initialize the first N registers to a uh, equal superposition of states, and you are going to to complete the measure the complete circuit, this number of shots. Uh, and with the result, you are going to build the measurement histogram and the theoretical histogram. The theoretical histogram can be computed because you know how to compute the values of the operator. And you are going to use a range 0 to 1 for making the histogram. And you are going to use the 2 to the m number of bins for doing the, the two histograms. Then you are going to compare the two histograms um, by using the following methods. For the random case, you are going to use the color of smear, that uh, was the same method that you used in the probability loading case. And you can use, use for the sad case the fidelity that is defined in, as can be shown here. There are a, bit, same, a lot of applications that use this, uh, this kernel, like the source algorithm, quantum linear equation, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we have presented the panel Hamiltonian. And again, we can provide the the kernel in this case, if we have an answer with a state phi de theta, the, the Palen Hamiltonian kernels aims to find the Hamiltonian such that this phi state is its ground state. And in fact, the ground state energy, it should be equal to zero. So this is the mathematical definition. And what is the benchmark test case? We are going to use answers that are moving from this particular uh, kind of layers. Uh, here is the layer that we are going to use for building the answer. We have some extra protection for uh, any of the qubits of the of the of the layer uh, that we apply the same um, parameter rotation we have a ladder of uh, control set gates remember that the last qubit control the first one and we have uh, uh, applied uh, some R set gates to any to any qubit with a fixed uh, with another fixed parameter. The parameters can be fixed using these equations, and in fact, it depends on the number of layers that you are going to, to apply. So, in the case of the benchmark test case, in order to execute the benchmark, to, you do have to do some preprocessing workflow. This preprocessing workflow consists of the number of qubits and the, the number of layers of the ANSAT. You are going to set the angles of the ANSAT, and you need to compute, this is very important, the uh, complete state using state simulator of the ANSAT, because for computing the corresponding panel Hamiltonian, you need this state. Uh, the computation of the panel Hamiltonian is a out of the scope of the of the speech, but you can see all the details in the benchmark test case documentation or even in the GitHub uh, notebooks of the case. Uh, when you have this Palen Hamiltonian, you need to decompose it as a linear decomposition of generalized Pauli matrices. And when you do that, you have all the ingredients mandatory for executing the case. You have the quantum architecture, you have the um, different parameters of the rotational gates, and you have the Pauli decomposition of the of the Palen Hamiltonian. So now you can execute the benchmark. How do you execute the benchmark? This is the procedure. You need to fix the number of qubits and the number of layers. You need to set the angles again. This is the same that in the last last step. And for each possible Pauli string that you have computed, you need to send to the quantum device the answer and the net mandatory rotations for doing measurements in the basis of the Pauli string. And you are going to compute the expected value of a at Pauli string. So this is depicted in the figure. You are going to build the answer, and you are going to do the rotations to the P0 string, and you are going to measure the computed expected value. Then, again, you have to build the answer. You are going to do the rotations for the uh, second Pauli string, and you are going to compute the expected value, and so on, so on, so on. And you are going, going to gather all the expected values, and you are computing the comp 
the ground standard energy as show it in this formula. This HUE, these are the coefficients that you have computed in the previous step in the workflow. So what is the verification method that we are going to do? We are going to use a verification method, the computed ground state energy, ground state energy, sorry, because uh, we are dealing with parent Hamiltonians and the ground state energy of the parent Hamiltonian, it should be zero. Uh, about the GitHub code, we have, we have to say that you don't have to uh, compute the complete Pauli decomposition because we have computed this Pauli decomposition for answers from three to 30 qubits and from one to four layers. Additionally, in the code, in the panel Hamiltonian code, we have uh, developed some code that allows you to compute the panel Hamiltonian and the panel decomposition for any answer that you want, but of course, you should use the MyQuell library. And finally, if you need uh, answers higher with uh, higher, higher than 30 qubits, you can use uh, uh, packages that we have implemented that use this com that compute the parent Hamiltonian using matrix product state techniques. In this case, these techniques are uh, lower resources consumption than state simulator. Um, so I finished the description of the, all the cases and I want to say some words about the GitHub. Uh, in the, this is the web patch of the, of the GitHub or where you can find and download the complete repository. Uh, there are two files that allow you to install all the mandatory uh, Python libraries needed to run the, to, to run the, the repository. You can find an environment YAML or a requirement txt depending of you use Conda or pip. And this is the code, this is the page with the code documentation. And I for me, the most important thing is that you can test in the library you use in Binder. In Binder, uh, this is a web page that you can deploy your GitHub code in an automatic way. The, the Binder uh, builds the complete environment and you can test the whole library without download to your computer and without installing the complete Python libraries. Finally, I want to say some about the folder structure of the of the of the repository here uh, we have the the tmbs folder where there are the four subfolders where contain a h micro benchmark uh, and the structure of a h former folder is the same you will have a inner um, folder where all the implementation of the benchmark test case was was done and you have in the root of the benchmark test case folder um, some scripts that are uh, general purpose scripts for executing the, the run case and for uh, scripts for gathering all the information from our run execution and generate the JSON file in the mandatory format of the NEAS QC. Additionally, for example, in the benchmark test case for the Panel Hamiltonian, you can find this uh, configuration file folder where all the um, Pauli decompositions that we mentioned before are stored as a CCV field, uh, files. So finally, as conclusions, uh, we have developed a, a benchmark suite for assessing quantum devices based on use cases of the NEASQC project. The TMB should help to improve the complete staff of a quantum hardware device. Microbenchmarks will be composed of a kernel, a benchmark test case, and a sample code implementation. Remember, the kernel should be defined in a high-level way, a mathematical or a procedural. And we have implemented, until the moment, uh, four microbenchmarks, the probability loading, the amplitude estimation and the quantum phase estimate, the quantum phase estimation and the parent Hamiltonian one. So uh, this is our presentation. So thanks for your attention. And if you have any question, please no no hesitate. Uh, I return the call to, to Pascal. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you, Diego, for these presentations. So as you say, it's now question time. I will try to share my slide. So we already have. Okay. Yeah, so for questions, you can ask your question in the chat or you can raise your hand. It's, it's up to you, whichever way is more comfortable for you. So let me find the chat because now I'm sharing. I can't see the chat, of course. <laughs> uh, dear. Okay, so uh, we have a first question from Antonio Marquez Romero. Is the parent Hamiltonian unique given the ground state? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Is the parent Hamiltonian? It's in the chat. You can you can see it okay. in the chat. Okay, is the parent Hamiltonian unique given the ground state? 
Mm, well, I don't know. I think so. I think that because you need, in, in fact, the, the process is, is in, it's reverse. You need the, mm, the state and you compute the pattern Hamiltonian. I think the, the computation is not necessarily unique uh, because you can depend, this is in the, in the, benchmark, in the benchmark case documentation. You can compute a pattern Hamiltonian where uh, interacts all the qubits interact with all the qubits, or you can build local pattern Hamiltonians. In the case of the benchmark case, we use a translational invariant uh, answer. So in this case, I think that the pattern Hamiltonian it should be unique uh, for for the for the for the state. I don't know if I if I uh, have solved the, the question. Uh, depending of the kind of pattern Hamiltonian. For the benchmark case, I think so because the, the the parent Hamiltonian is very, very precisely defined, and it has some, trans uh, some translational invariant. So I don't know if I have uh, answered the, your question. Well, Antonio will, will tell us. Uh, and there is another question in the chat again from uh, Laurent Querella. What are the next micro benchmarks you plan to address? Um... Uh, well, um, the the idea is that uh, until now we have covered the work package five and the work package four. So the only work package that we need is to uh, is the work package six that is so, uh, related with machine learning and something like that. And we are uh, looking for for cases, but. Uh, uh, at the moment, we need to have another interaction with the uh, partners. With the partners, so, so I don't know. Uh, we are. Uh, we have to look. Uh, we have some proposals, and we have to analyze. But uh, at the moment, the the things that uh, we think that were better suit for the for this for this benchmark were the four cases that we have developed until the moment, but we are going to uh, chat with the people of the work package for getting more, another more micro benchmarks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the, yeah, for the yeah. moment we have benchmarks from two work I packages. I can't speak and... with my computer. Okay. okay. You, you have a problem, Diego? Uh, Technical problem? Uh, no, because we have echo. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. That one, one second. Yes. Okay. So, so well, uh, our uh, search of new benchmark uh, is driven by domains. I mean, uh, we asked to a domain of application of quantum computer, uh, which are the kernels that are commonly uh, used uh, in their own domain. So sometimes we find that several domains tells you both of us use quantum phase estimation, for instance, or probability loading. So this is the kind of search that we have to keep doing. And we need to look for new kernels from the domains that have not been covered from the NIST project. That would be the idea. We have several candidates, but <laughs> we will- so Stay tuned, <laughs> maybe <Later>. more <laughs> before the end of the project. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Diego. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, we had uh, um, oh yeah, actually there is a conversation going on in the chat. So Antonio was happy with the answer uh, to his question. Uh, so yeah, I invite you to open the chat and, and look at the exchanges. Do you have any uh, new question? Uh, I don't see any raised hand. I, you know, I'm afraid of missing something, but no. No new questions? No question in the in the chat either. Come on, that's your opportunity to know more about this benchmark suite before testing it. Of course, <laughs> that's the whole point of the exercise. No, no more questions. Diego or Gonzalo, is there anything you wanted to add uh, before we we end uh, this webinar? Sorry, well, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, well, I, I would like to encourage uh, all the uh, attendants uh, to visit uh, the website of the project and also the repository with the code. And it's extremely important for us to get feedback 
uh, from other people about the suite uh, because that will be an important contribution and feedback that we could use uh, to improve the code base and also the corresponding documents. And thank you for your attention, obviously. And additionally, I want to say that uh, remember that you don't have to to download the complete code. You can use the binder execution for doing the testing if you want to to test the the, the repository. So thank you for your attention. And um, we are ready to receive even question by mail. I think that uh, we have posted the mail into the into the presentation. I don't know, Pascal. Can you ask? I don't know, but in any case, I mean, if you have a, a, a question, uh, there is a contact form on the NISC website and it comes straight to my uh, mailbox. So uh, uh, don't hesitate to, to ask your questions or, or answer the, uh, you will receive an email after the webinar with the, um, the presentation and also the links to uh, additional material. Uh, you can answer that. It will not fall into a, a void. It will come to my mailbox. So uh, if, you, if you want to know more, really don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, so no more questions, no raised hand, no message. Okay, then I think we will close for today. I would like to thank our two speakers. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you, Diego. It was very interesting. Uh, I would like to thank our audience too. Uh, it was nice to, to have you uh, have you again because I see we have a few regular attendees. That's really nice. So I hope to <clears throat> see you again on the 6th of February. We'll have another webinar, this time dedicated to finance applications, a very interesting area. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, if you have an interest in other use cases, don't hesitate to have a look at our website. I posted in, in the chat the link to uh, the, the, the webinar webpage because there you can find the list of webinars, past and, and future, uh, the links to the information about the webinars. Uh, so really a lot of material is available. Don't hesitate to go to the website. Also lots of publications. Um, we have, uh, uh, we've ha published a, a lot about the different use cases. So if you have an interest, I'm sure you'll find something that will help you. So thank you, everyone, and hope to talk to you again on the 6th of February. So I think we will close for today. Any last minute question? Usually we have a last minute question. No, not mm -hmm. today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, bye.